scripture reading for today comes from two places in the Bible. First, from Genesis chapter 50, verses 25 and 26. Genesis 50, 25 reads, Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110 years, and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. Our second verse comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22. By faith Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. This is the word of God. Thank you, our praise team and our choir for preparing our hearts to really focus on the word of God. As our hearts are focusing on the word, I pray that this will be a time of having a spiritual communion with the Father God in heaven. Amen. Uh, today, I'd like to share grace with you uh, with a sermon entitled, Joseph, the Fulfiller of the Covenant of the Torch. Joseph, the Fulfiller of the Covenant of the Torch. Now, the Covenant of the Torch is very important. It appears in Genesis chapter 15. It's one of the covenants that God made with Father of Faith, Abraham. This covenant is very important so that scholars and theologians call it as the centerpiece of all covenants. Okay, shall we turn to the slide, please? Yes. So as you can see, there are seven covenants that God made with our father of faith, Abraham. And the fourth covenant, which is in Genesis 15, is the centerpiece of all seven covenants called the covenant of the torch. The reason this covenant is so important is because it is the blueprint. It is a blueprint of how God's children can build his kingdom here on earth. Therefore, when we understand the fulfillment of the covenant of torch, we can also understand how we must live in our life of faith to also partake in this great blessing of building God's kingdom together here on earth. And when we look at this covenant of torch, we can see the final fulfiller, the final fourth generation to whom this covenant is promised is Joseph, right? So there are four generations are mentioned throughout the book of Genesis, and they are Abraham, and Abraham's son Isaac, and then Jacob, and then Joseph. Okay, let's turn to uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Although Joseph, uh, Jacob had many sons, 12 sons, right? But God clearly says in the Bible, the birthright, which means the fulfiller of the covenant, this special right that's given by God goes to not the number one, number two, number three, number fourth son, but Joseph, who was the 11th. Shall we read this verse together to check? Ready, begin. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but because they found his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that he is not enrolled in the genealogy according to the birthright. The Judah prevailed over his brothers, and from him came the leader, yet the birthright belonged to whom? Joseph. Here God emphasized twice how the birthright the special privilege to fulfill the covenant of torch was handed over to whom? To Joseph. New Testament also explains that Joseph is the fourth generation and the fulfillment of the covenant of a torch. This verse in Hebrews is very interesting because it really points to some kind of like accreditation of why these four patriarchs received this birthright. Okay, so let's first turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. There is this pattern. Hebrews chapter 11 is known as chapter of faith. The people listed here are acknowledged by God for their faith, right? So in verse 8, it says, by faith, Abraham, right? And verse 20 continues, the succession of faith went to his son, Isaac, by beginning the verse with, by faith, Isaac, also, if you turn to verse 21, next verse, 
It says, by faith, Jacob. And then the final fourth generation is, verse 22, by faith, Joseph, right? But please note, what does God remember of Joseph's life? He had this extraordinary life. He was a Jew, but he became a prime minister of this, the greatest country at the time, Egypt. Yet God does not remember that part, but he remembers this part. Two together. Get ready, begin. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. So there are three things I would like you to remember based on this verse. God remembers Joseph when he was dying. God remembers Joseph in his deathbed. And second, God remembers Joseph for his message to his descendants concerning Exodus. Okay. Second is Exodus. And third, God remembers Joseph because he told his descendants about his bones. So it's three things. Okay. We know in John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus himself declared, all the scriptures testifies about him. That means even in the Old Testament, where the name Jesus does not appear, every part of the Old Testament also testifies about whom? Jesus Christ. And today, I'd like to examine together how this Joseph, who lived thousands of years ago, foreshadowed Jesus Christ. Okay. When we understand how Joseph foreshadows Jesus Christ, we can also understand how we can also live as the disciples of Jesus, as this uh, second service has taught us today, right? Let's go to the scene, the deathbed of Joseph, okay? Let's go to Genesis chapter 50, verse 24 to 25. This is the message that Joseph gives to his descendants. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. This shows that he's a fourth generation, right? And then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. So you can see here, he repeats the same phrase twice. What is it? God will surely take care of you. Here, word take care, if you go to the next slide, is pakad in Hebrew. When this word is used in connection to God himself, this means God will pay a visit to his people. But his visitation to God's people will be a blessing because God will take care of you and bring you out from here to the promised land. However, if you're not God's people, God's visitation also means punishment. In other words, execution of the judgment. So already Joseph's last will and testament shows the last days, right? You can see that Joseph was aware of how the Lord will come and pay a visit 360 years later to Egypt. And he did, pay an, uh, he did uh, punish them and paid a judgment executed judgment upon the Israelites. And at the same time, his visitation delivered the Israelites from the sinful world of Egypt and led them to the promised land. Okay. So, you see, this, another part we must notice is when Joseph said, because God will come, because God will visit you, Keep my bones and carry my bones up from here with you. If you look at Genesis chapter 50, the beginning part of this chapter, and chapter 49, we see another grand funeral procession. That funeral procession is for Jake, Joseph's father, Jacob. After Jacob and his 70 family members came to Egypt to live with his son, who's now the prime minister of Egypt. Jacob dies 
in Egypt because he believed in God's promise that he will take us to the land of Canaan, Jacob said, when I die, bury me not here in Egypt, but in Canaan. So already there, Joseph and his brothers made their entry into Canaan. Already there, they know the route all the way to go back to Canaan. So they've entered Canaan once already. They have seen the Canaan land, Canaan land already, right? So Joseph, when he died, being in a position that's much higher than his own father, could have requested, bury me in Canaan as well, right? They just went there, and he had all the power and authority to have this grand procession, just as his father Jacob did. But what did he ask instead? He says, when you leave, when God returns, when you leave, carry me with you. So Joseph could have chosen to be buried beforehand, like his father Jacob in Canaan. But Joseph refused, did not choose that path. He rather chose a path to be mummified, as you read in our main text today. He did not want to be buried alone in Canaan. He wanted to be buried together with his people. So back in those days, mummification um, actually symbolizes that as long as the mummy exists, people believe that the person was still alive with them. Right? So when Joseph said, when I die, no, he said, I am dying, but God will visit you. I am dying, but carry my bones from here when you have your exodus. This is a powerful statement. Joseph died physically, but his faith did not die even in the face of death. His faith continued to live on and remained with the people. Therefore, the bones of Joseph for the Israelites became like a symbol, like Emmanuel, right? What does Emmanuel mean? God is with us. So bones of Joseph symbolized God's covenant that he will certainly come back and deliver us and bring us to promised land will hold. It still continue to be with them. That's what bones of Joseph represented for them. Because of this statement that Joseph made, we can see in the realm of a spiritual world. Thousands of years later, when Jesus came, Jesus said, you know your forefather, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who have been long been dead, right? Thousands of years ago. But to Jesus, he said, they are still alive. Jesus says, they have never died. They are living. For I am not the God of the dead. I am God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am God of the living. You see? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 22, verse 32. Let's read together. Ready? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. This is what Jesus Christ himself proclaimed. We can see the definition of the true living. We may have the name that we are alive, but if there's no faith, trusting in the promise of God, to God, we may seem as dead. But to God, our faith can still live. Even though we may die, we are still alive in God's sight, as long as we hold on to God's covenant. Okay. This is a very key in the covenant of the torch, in building God's kingdom. This kingdom of God is built by faith, not by the physical things of this world. Right. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 50, verse 26. 
So Joseph died at the age of 110 years, and he chose to be embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. He chose to remain together with his people. He did not want to go before the people and be buried all alone. How does this show Jesus Christ? The Bible says everything in the Bible testifies of Jesus Christ. Joseph's bones, when he died, he rather chose to became, become one with the people of Israel. That's what his bones stand for. He remained together with the Israel for 360 years until the time of the Exodus because he died in 1806 BC. And the Exodus finally came in 1446 BC. So for nearly three, for 360 years, the bones of Joseph was a sign of Emmanuel to the people of Israel saying, God will surely come back. God will take us from here, from the sinful world, and take us to the promised land. This is a blueprint of what's going to happen in our life through Jesus Christ. Jesus also chose the path of his exodus. Okay, So here, he could have transfigured by himself and gone up to heaven. But he did not choose this path. He rather chose to die, to become one with his people. Okay. So by death of Jesus, we became one with the Lord. Let's check the verses in the Bible. Let's turn to Luke chapter 9, verse 31. This is actually a scene, a mount of transfiguration. Jesus already transfigured from the people for the, for the people to see, right? And here what he did with talking with Moses and Elijah, he says Jesus appeared in the glory and we're speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Please note this word departure is exodus, right? Remember Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22. Joseph, in his deathbed, spoke of the exodus and his bones. So already on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus was speaking of his departure. How is he going to depart from the world? Not by himself. He wanted to have his exodus with all of us. You see, the death of Joseph really reminds us of death of Jesus Christ. And the key word in this death is oneness, to become one with his people. Let us turn to So let's actually before we look at more verses, what where was the final destination? It was Shechem. When we go into Shechem and look at its redemptive historical meaning, this death of Jesus to become one with us becomes clear. Shechem actually is a very, very important place in the redemptive history. First, the forefather, Abraham, right? When Abraham first went into the land of Canaan, the very first place where God appeared and said, Abraham, I'm going to give you all this land to you and your descendants, was here in Shechem. Okay? That's in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. And there, Abraham built his very first altar. Okay? And then secondly, it's also the place where Jacob purchased right after coming from Patan Aram. Remember, he ran away from his brother Esau. For 20 years, he came back, right? So in Patan Aram, uh, Genesis chapter 33, verse 18 through 20. We see where Jacob actually comes back and buys this piece of land. 
So once you buy it, it becomes your possession, right? So already Jacob secures this place called Shechem. Why? It's probably because his father, Isaac, his grandfather, Abraham, said, hey, that's the place where God appeared. When you have money, when you have time, make sure to buy this land, right? It must be already a very special place for the whole family. And where does it become later? Jacob, when he dies, he bequeathed this land to Joseph. And he says, I'll give you one more portion. The word portion in Hebrew in this verse is actually Shechem. And so this becomes later, indeed, burial place for Joseph. How amazing is this? It's in Joshua chapter 24, verse 32. After they make entry into Canaan, they finally bury Joseph in Canaan. Okay, and then the verse about how Jacob blesses Joseph with the Shechem is in 48, verse 21 through 22. But one more note about the Shechem. It's a really heartbreaking place. It is the very place where Father Jacob sends his son Joseph to see the welfare of his brothers. And remember, of course, it's not at Shechem. He was Dothan where the brothers tried to kill him. But Father sends Joseph to Shechem. So this is where father sends his son to. I don't know if you can see this low. And where he gets killed. That is found in Genesis chapter 37, verse 13. The same way Jesus sent, Jesus was sent by God, right? And to where Jesus was sent, that is where Jesus died, right? So Shechem is a very significant place. Shechem actually means, redemptive historically, very important um, things. Let's actually look at next verse, redemptive meaning of Shechem. Where Joseph was buried, where Shechem actually means shoulder or bearing burdens, right? And Jesus bore all of our sins and was crucified, right? That's what Shechem means, place where the Lord buried, uh, uh, bore our burdens. The word Shechem, Shechem is derived from the verb Shechem, and Shechem actually means also to rise early in the morning. The very place where the Lord died by bearing all of our sins and burdens was the very place where he resurrected early in the morning, right? So here Shechem represents redemptive historically the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay. So this is a place of death, but because of Lord's death, there is a power of resurrection and life. Let's look at the verse where the father Jacob sends son Joseph to. Let's go to Genesis chapter 37, verse 13. Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. And he said to him, I will go. The same way. God sent Jesus to this earth to find the welfare of his brothers. But the brothers ended up killing Jesus. That's where Shechem is. So here, Joseph remained together with the Israelites and made their exodus and come into Shechem. And we know that this place foreshadows how Jesus Christ came for our sake and he chose a path of death. And this death 
is very mysterious. This death seemed like a defeat to Satan. I'm sure when Joseph died, Satan probably laughed, right? And the face of this death scene, they said, where is God's promise of the covenant of torch? I won. Because when the fourth generation is dying, it means God's covenant can no longer be fulfilled. God said, you will return to Canaan in the fourth generation. That word does not seem to hold anymore. The same way, when Jesus died on the cross, everybody fell into great despair. This Lord, Jesus Christ, who says, I am the life and resurrection, where is he going? So at the moment of his death, Satan probably laughed at the face of the crucifixion, saying, I won. God's covenant does not hold true. But you see, death is a mysterious gate of fulfilling God's covenant. Because of death, Joseph was able to embrace the entire Israel. Because of death, Jesus was able to embrace all of us as one with him. And together, we're going to have a departure from this world. Let's turn to next verse. Romans chapter 6, verse 30. Ready, begin. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? We have received baptism, right? The moment we receive baptism, we have been baptized into the death of Jesus Christ. That means we by dying together with Jesus, we have become one with him. This is a mystery that Satan does not know. Brothers and sisters, this is why we have this boldness in the face of death, just as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob demonstrated in Joseph. Let's go to another verse, Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 through 29. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. It means we became one with Jesus, right? You put on Jesus Christ. That means you and Jesus are one. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all, what? One in Christ Jesus. That is what the death of Jesus Christ has done for us. So verse 29 comes this famous verse. And if you belong to Christ, then... You are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. Just as God promised the covenant of torch to Israel, because they are descendants of Abraham, the same way, because now through Jesus' death, we became one with him, because now we belong to Jesus Christ, we have also become the participant of the covenant of torch, the heir according to the promise. Let's look at one more verse. Romans chapter 6, verse 8 through 9. Now, if we have died with Christ, what happens? We believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. Death has no power over Jesus Christ anymore. And with that Jesus, we have a made one. Amen? Right? That's why in the end, we can rebuke death, as 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says. Oh, death, where is your sting? Because of the power of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, if Joseph, the human being, is considered as a living being to God, despite of his physical death, how far more our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord lives. Death has no reign over him. When we are one with him, death has no reign over us either. Amen? I pray that this truth becomes ever more evident in everyday walk of our life. So together, as we grow one into Jesus Christ, we'll become bold in the face, even in death. Amen? We have to truly understand this mystery of death, how death is a victory. Okay. Therefore, death, because death no longer reigns over us, whether we live, whether we die, we don't matter. It doesn't matter to us anymore. More, right? We are lords. 
Let's turn to Romans chapter 14, verse 8. Let's read together, shall we? Ready, begin. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord. I pray that we can make this confession of faith in every situation in our life, right? Whether we live, whether we die, we belong to Jesus Christ. We will always be alive. We have the faith of the living. Amen? Okay. So, now we've become one with Jesus Christ. As a birthright was given to Joseph, our firstborn Jesus Christ also gave us birthright to be the firstborns in this great movement of building God's kingdom, right? So now that we become one with Jesus Christ and Shechem, with the power of the cross, what shall we do? All right. John chapter 11, verse 25, 26. Jesus here proclaims, I don't think it's on the slide, so can we all turn to John chapter 11, verse 25 to 26. Jesus makes this fervent appeal to the people. He wanted people to believe this is why he has come. John chapter 11, verse 25 to 26. Let's read together. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Yes. See, even Mary and Martha believed in that. Yes, when we believe in the Lord, when we believe in the Messiah, even if you were to die, we will live again. That is a resurrection. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life itself. Right? So he says, yes, if you die and believe you can still live through resurrection, right? But he says, I am life, means if you live and believe, then you will never see death. And Jesus says, do you believe in this? Let's read verse 26. Ready, begin. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? It's hard because everybody has been dying ever since the fall of Adam. Through one man's sin, death spread to all men. So all men are now tricked to believe that death is part of natural phenomena that mankind must face. But here Jesus Christ came and proclaimed, I am the resurrection, and not only that, I am the life. If you believe in me and live, that you will never see death. This is the message that Jesus wanted to give to the people. And Panganjir Church has been so blessed to be nurtured to this day on the word of transfiguration, not only on the word of resurrection, based on John chapter 11, verse 25 through 26. So now that we have received this great blessings of become one in Jesus Christ, now that we are one with Jesus, whom the death no longer reigns over, now that we have received this boldness and power to, to face even death, what is the duty the firstborn must do for his father? To spread life. We exist not only for ourselves to live. Firstborns always take care of the younger siblings, right? We exist. We have this great, amazing duty to save the world. That's exactly what Joseph did. When he went to Pharaoh and became the prime minister, Pharaoh gave Joseph the name, which is very significant. Let's turn to next verse, Genesis. Okay, chapter 50, verse 20. Here, after all those ordeal, the years of suffering that Joseph had to face, because his brother tried to kill him, that's how he ended up in Egypt, right? This is what Joseph says to his brothers in the end. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. And therefore, 
Pharaoh named Joseph, Genesis 41, verse 45, Zephanath Panea, which means sustainer of life. Because of Joseph, there was a great famine that people could survive. And Joseph realized all the pain and agony and the ill treatment that he has received by his own brothers, he did not have any grudge against it. He actually reversed it and turned it into a blessing, saying that all of this hardship that came between you and I was so that we can bring life to the world. Zephanat Panea. And I pray that will become our names as well. As an individual, at your workplaces, in your family, wherever you go, may you impart this precious life that Jesus has gave to us. And as a collective group, as a Pyongyangji church, or churches that you represent, or as Korea, this nation, may we be able to impart this life, the good news, the death is not to reign over us all, but death is our last enemy, as 1 Corinthians chapter 15 explains. May we become the proclaimer of this precious gospel, good news to all human race. In the same way, Jesus says, I came not to be served, although he's a Messiah, although he's a true king. He said, I came to serve you. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Just as a son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. May we also give our life for many people. As we do so, I believe there will be a bursting of a great work of life in our lives and around the world. Amen. So as a, a closing, um, I would like to share with you uh, a, sh a short report from India. I purposely did not put in any photos with a direct face, except this one. <laughs> okay, there are about 47 um, pastors came um, from India, this great region in India. And um, you see the Pastor Hong and this Pastor Inam J. He actually is a translator there. Because there's still persecutions, I had to actually purposely take out some photos that kind of, like, you know, front, frontal view. Uh, next slide, please. And so there was a group discussion time. And if you look at the lady on the very far left, you know, she's standing in front of the books. For them, English is not easy to read. But she was standing in front of the books and says, I've never heard a message like this. And my eyes are open to the Bible now. No, oh, let me. I'm blocking the view, sorry. And so she, uh, you know, the book is sold for like 10,000 won or $10 in, in our currency, but their, their uh, uh, daily, uh, their monthly wage is like 200,000 won. So like $200, right? Yeah. And so when we sell this book for uh, $10, <laughs> that's like too expensive. So we ended up selling the book for like 15,000 won. <laughs> and she actually bought all five of the books, you know, and, and, and we were um, very, very uh, amazed. And you see the people, they, I really repented a lot because we, we took us like what, 10 years? No, uh, 2017, 2018, 2007, 2008, 11 years, right? We study the word of redemptive history. They, this is their second time studying the word of redemptive history. So a few days. And they were already doing all the calculations. And their hearts are on fire saying, we have to spread this word. We have to teach these words to our people. So we can see how fervent they were in the group discussion time. Next slide, please. And so here, this pastor was presenting how Adam and Lamech lived, you know, contemporaneous for 56 years, finally. And um, he wrote a lot after that, but I didn't take those photos yet. So it's said Adam had said when he was 130. You know, that's the, f the part he had. After listening to just once, they're able to do this, right? And um, they're really going through the time of discussion as because they have now this job to present this, right? <laughs> after like 30 minute discussion. Next slide, please. Uh, I, I just could not stop taking photos, you know, how, mu how well they took the notes, how much they're really absorbing um, themselves into the word. Uh, next, please. And here, the hard one. 
You know how um, Solomon's Temple was built in six years and six months, right? Not seven years and seven months. It's based on book four. And so after listening to this, now they're doing all the calculations, and we are making joke, like India, the people of India must ha were known, are known to be the smartest with numbers. They're the greatest mat mathematicians, right? But here, uh, we, actually me, I am so awful with numbers, you know? And you were teaching them the mathematics of the Bible. We thought it was, it was very amazing, okay? And then there's another, um, this, this guy actually flew all the way from Mumbai, uh, which is really far from New Delhi. New Delhi is up north, Mumbai is on the, the west coast. So he flew in just to learn this. You know? um, and they're drawing the six series, six months. You can see, right? They were really um, doing that correctly. So we were very, very impressed. Okay. I think, I think that's it, right? In the end time, God says, just as in Joseph's days, there will be famine. And God is looking for his spiritual Zephanet Panea, the sustainer of life. And there are many, many nations represented here. You know, France, Pakistan, US, you know, many different places around the world, right? May we respond to our Father's calling. Jesus said, just as Father sent me, now I send you. Let us say amen to his calling. Let us be the one to spread this word. In however, any, in any way it's possible for us, right? And let us live to truly become a people who impart the work of great life. Amen? So let's read Amos chapter 3. Oh, I'm sorry. Amos chapter 8, verse 11. The famine is not, uh, is not for bread or life, a bread or thirst for water, but hearing the word of the Lord. Let's read together. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread or thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. The true bread of life is Jesus Christ, right? Let us give out the special bread of life. As John chapter 6, verse 35 says, I am the bread of life. Let us become a true witness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, let's close with prayer. Our Father, we thank you so much for opening the scriptures to us to teach us that death no longer reigns over our Lord Jesus Christ. A death was a special gate of mystery that allowed Jesus and us to become one. Help us to truly have strong conviction in what you have done for us as we Learn more about Joseph and the Old Testament. For you taught us the, everything the scripture testifies about you. So, Father, help us to know more about you. Help us to know more about us and strengthen us so we can truly live up to the calling by being your true witness in this end time. Please bless Shallow to become spiritual Zephaniah Panea, to spread this true bread of life, to all nations and people and tongues. May everyone who's represented here, Father, you know what our agony, our hardships are. But Father, help us to be fixed with this great vision that you have for us so we can therefore overcome all the ill treatments, all the hardships we may face, but rise above it all to reign together with our Lord Jesus Christ in his kingdom. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give all the glory to our Father.